After three years of quietness, our growing hunger is finally satiated. Toby Fox, creator of Undertale, finally released a new game. Deltarune! Chapter 1. Lovers of papyrus, both font and skeleton, rejoice! <laughs> For many of us, Undertale was a turning point in video games. It was the moment we realized a game can be more than just entertainment. They can make you feel. They can teach. They can make you self-reflect and want to change who you are for the better. Undertale did that to me and many others. It was a game created not just for enjoyment, but holds a deeper meaning and more profound message. The message that each choice matters. And that realization hit hard for a lot of us. Too often we believe that what we do doesn't mean anything. America's voter turnout, am I right? By the way, if you're in America, please vote today! But Undertale showed us that isn't the case. That each action, whether violent or not, changes what our future holds. That we do in fact write our own story. That is the beauty of Undertale. Besides the comedy, the mechanics, the quirkiness, it has a message that hits home. But this video isn't about Undertale. On the contrary, we're about to discuss Undertale's spiritual successor, Deltarune, and everything we know about the game. I'm warning you right now, the game is not Undertale. It may have the same comedy, similar characters, and style, but it will not give us the same emotional pull of Undertale. So if you're ready to uncover the truth behind Deltarune, to hear the siren song of gaming chime once more, then prepare yourself for a tale that may never be completed, for the characters we love dropped within a world we've never experienced, for a journey that changes everything we knew about Toby Fox and his games. This is the story of Deltarune, the story you never knew. First things, well, second, it, it's after the intro. Second thing, second, let's go over the going ons of Deltarune. Before the story begins, before we get into the game, really, we get this strange opening wherein our soul heart from Undertale is essentially beamed up like in Star Trek. This is precursed by the words, are you there? Are we connected? And followed by, excellent truly excellent. We're already in a weird start to this game, and I already have some feelings about what this particular scene means. Last time in Undertale, when we had just words and eerie music on the screen, it was Chara talking specifically to us to the player. So having something similar happen at the beginning of this game makes me think that the game is again talking to us. The heart beaming in resembles our soul being joined with the characters. Our soul and our will is connected to our character through the heart makes sense. Let's keep going. The game then asks us to create a vessel. We go through a bunch of pixelated Skyrim character creation what's who's it until Deltarune finally asks us for our character's name. Then it asks for our name. This clarifies what I was just talking about. Just look at the cursor to choose everything. It's our heart. Our choices and our soul is reflected by that heart. And that realization makes the next scene even more creepy than it already was. Our vessel gets discarded. No one can choose who they are in this world. Just from this one scene, we already know that this game is not Undertale. It's not a sequel. It's nothing like Undertale at all. That was just scary. And we'll come back to why this entire scene was so important later. Suddenly, we're in a room with, oh my god, goat mom! And our name is Chris? Uh, that's weird. We get out of bed at our mom's behest, and uh, th those clothes sure do look familiar. Eh, I'm sure it's nothing. But let's pause the game right here. This room already tells us a lot about our character before we go anywhere. Look at this room. It's obviously shared by two people. Us and someone else. Chris, or whoever we are, has only one object on their side of the room, a cage in a red wagon. However, the other side is filled with trophies, decorations, those cool glow-in-the-dark star things, and more! There's even something under the bed on the other side. If we go inspect it, we're notified there's CDs under the bed and a game console. What this tells us is that Toby Fox is purposefully leaving out our character's past and personality. Everything on our side is blank. Our only 
possession is that cage. This is much like Frisk in Undertale. Our actions created the person Frisk was in the game. So maybe that's what Toby is trying to do here? Then again, maybe not. If we walk into the kitchen and look at the fridge, we're notified there's a picture of us, our mom and our brother. So using deductive reasoning you only gain from years upon years of YouTubing, the bed next to ours is likely our brother's bed. And all that stuff in our room is his. Walking outside triggers a cutscene where we get into the car with Goat Mom and she says that Asriel is going to visit next week. We know Asriel, it's Flowey, but uh, as a goat and, and stuff. This game has a ton of the same characters, but Asriel coming home next week proves a lot of things. First off, it shows that we're not in the same timeline as Undertale. This house is obviously outside, the sun is shining, meaning that it can't be a prequel or we'd be in the underground. Also, Asriel isn't dead, or a flower, he, he's alive. And judging by the things in his room, he's had a fairly normal life. This isn't a sequel either. So alternative timeline confirmed. Also, Toby said so in one of his latest posts addressing the game. But I figured it out before then. Don't diminish my accomplishments, Toby! Ahem. <clears throat> we get to school, passing some familiar faces on the way. This is where the game gets interesting. After we take a seat, in walks the talk of the town. The gal who can growl. The sister who is pissed. Er, it's Susie! Now that's how you make an entrance. We already know Susie is a grade A bad booty who doesn't take shit talky mushrooms from anyone, and she's our project partner. Yay. Of course, Alfie's misplaced the chalk, or, or Susie ate it, so Chris and Susie gotta go to the supply closet to get another box. We walk out of the room to Susie eating what I can only assume is some chalk. I is this a thing, by the way? Do, do people eat chalk? Can you guys post in the comments if you know someone who eats chalk? I'm, I'm just confused by it. It doesn't even taste that good. Anyway, Susie corners us like she's gonna kiss us, or yep, yep, she's gonna ruin my shirt. You know how hard it is to get a shirt correctly ironed, Susie? Goat Mom was up until 5 a.m. to get this done. Susie then accuses us of thinking about ratting her and her chalk face out. Which is odd, considering Susie knows we don't talk. So why would she worry about us telling someone? Anyway, right before she's about to bite our face off, she drops us, cause she likes Goat Mom, apparently. Susie tells us we're going to do the group project, but no matter what we answer, Susie lets us know it doesn't matter, which felt wrong. It was the first time we had a choice all game, and it got taken from us. This is important. Remember the line from the very beginning, no one can choose who they are in this world? Let's put this first non-choice in that bread basket and return to it later. We get to the closet, which gets all Narnia-ish, locks us in, and pulls the floor out from under us. Susie is freaking out, and we lose her in the ruckus. We come to looking like a dog -am warrior! Look at us! We're awesome, and we've arrived in a weird place. Upon exploring, we eventually come to some agitated joysticks, and look! Our heart! It's always good to have some proof of where your soul is, and there it is. We are in control! Huzzah! We finally run into Susie and accompany her to a castle, where we're told the legend of the Deltarune, which is very similar to Undertale's underground monsters and above-ground human story. The important part is that three heroes appear. A human, a monster, and a prince from the dark. Of course, said prince gets ousted right from under our noses as this spade on a bike rides in. This small glass of water is named Lancer, and he talks like that. Though I had to do the same thing the entire time when we streamed the Deltarune. Clowns are back in town. Twitch.tv slash treesicle. Every day at 3 p.m. Pacific time. This is where Deltarune truly begins to shine. With Lancer and the Dark Prince Ralsei in the picture, we've essentially got our main game gang. We're the strong silent type, Ralsei is cute and anxious, Susie is rough and mean, Lancer is silly and playful. We travel through the dark land, occasionally fighting enemies and running into Lancer over and over. Every time you fight, Susie insists on attacking. You literally cannot stop her from violence. The best you can do is warn the other team of Susie's onslaught. For a spiritual sequel to Undertale, it was mind-boggling that there's a character that you cannot stop from attacking. When we're used to a genocide or pacifist run, not having a choice of what happens to a character just feels 
wrong. It's almost like the game is trying to tell you something by not allowing us to control Susie's actions. Susie eventually decides she's fed up with being the good guy and joins Lancer to become a bad guy. But as we find her with Lancer, it becomes more and more apparent that their evil plans aren't very evil at all. I in fact, they're just hanging out and having fun. So much so that when we do eventually fight Lancer and Susie, Susie stops the battle when Lancer starts getting hurt. This is a massive change from the beginning of the game. Susie didn't care about anyone. She literally said that if the world is destroyed, it's not her problem. I didn't tell you that before, but I am now. And yet, she's stopping the fight because Lancer is hurt. Susie is evolving. She's realizing there's more to life than just violence and pain and loneliness. In fact, under the right circumstances, there's friendship. After the fight, Susie even lets Lancer join your group as a token of their friendship. Despite being hungry, she gives up a piece of candy so Lancer can eat it. Remember, this is the same person that slammed us into a locker earlier the same day. But Lancer showed love and admiration to Susie, slowly peeling back enough layers to uncover a person who not only has feelings and hopes, but actually cares deeply about her friends. She's just never had any friends to speak of before now. This all comes to a head as we close in on the card castle. Lancer freaks out because his dad is going to want to kill his new friends and runs home. Susie and Ralsei follow Hot on his trail while we lag behind, avoiding the guards. We all get captured and thrown in dungeon cells. Susie feels entirely betrayed by the first person she considered a friend. Susie eventually breaks out of her cell and confronts Lancer, resulting in a huge moment. A point where she decides that no one actually cares about her and tries to kill Lancer. But we can tell from Lancer's attacks he doesn't want to hurt Susie. And on her last attack, Susie intentionally misses. She doesn't want to hurt Lancer. So much so that she promises not to kill his father. The girl who wouldn't listen to us at all, who attacked no matter what we did, is now promising that she won't kill someone. This experience lets her open up to Ralsei and Chris too, letting her know she has support and she can act instead of attack. So Chris, Ralsei, and Susie make their way through the castle, leading up to the battle with Lancer's dad. When we get there, we must fight, and the only change between fighting people and not throughout the game is whether Ralsei puts him to sleep or he gets ushered out by his servants at the end of the battle. We use the fountain and appear in an unused classroom. Now this is extremely interesting. Around us are a bunch of games and cards. It's essentially all the stuff we see during the game. So were we just playing? Did we get sucked into some realm where all these things came to life? We'll never know for sure, at least not for a while. But Susie is certainly changed. She wants to go back again tomorrow with us. From smashing us against the wall to wanting to hang out, it's been quite a ride. This allows us some free time to explore, go to our dad's shop, who looks pretty familiar, see his scary flowers that are eerily like the souls from Undertale, find Sans in Alligator Escort, Alfie's in a Crack Alley, and a bunch of other stuff that we may talk about at a later date. We get home, go to sleep, and during the night we awake and... Wow. This is what the entire story has been leading up to. All along, we've been playing as Chris. We know nothing about our character. We have nothing in our room to define them. No dialogue with others to understand. And our connection with them is severed at the very end of the game. Remember those words from the beginning? No one can choose who they are in this world. This world is not the world of Undertale. In Undertale, we could choose. But here, our choices 
don't matter. Every choice from the very first one of Susie asking us how's that sound has been completely irrelevant. The ending is the same. We are not in control. We can only control that heart, and that heart has been disconnected from every character in the game. In truth, this game isn't even about Chris. At least, not yet. The main character of Chapter 1 wasn't us. It was Susie. Sure, we played as Chris, but what does that matter? Susie's the one who went through profound change. She's the one who learned through this experience. She's the one whose entire outlook on life is different after the journey we went through. But Chris? Chris was empty. No choice mattered. Nothing mattered. And this is the primary difference between Undertale and Deltarune. Undertale had a specific message it wanted us to learn. Your actions affect others. Deltarune has no such message. At least, not yet. And if it does get an underlying message, the theme certainly won't be that your choices affect change. Every choice we had, from the vessel at the very beginning all the way through trying to kill or spare people at the end, had no no effect on the outcome of the game, nor will it in the future. Toby has already said that Deltarune only has one ending. So let's put all we've talked about together for what it means about Deltarune. Our choices don't matter. Our character isn't even the main character. It's an alternate universe, and we, the creator, are no longer connected to anyone in this game. This isn't exactly shaping up to be a happy ending, and honestly, it shouldn't be. Think about what Toby Fox has done. With Undertale, he made the ultimate game of choice, where everything you did. If you killed one person, it completely changed the outcome of the game. Now he's made a game where it doesn't matter what you do. Your choices won't create any change in the outcome. Should we be expecting a happy ending under those circumstances? If you can fight whoever you want and the outcome doesn't change, that only leaves one option for the ending a bad one. Toby Fox wanted to create something that could rival Undertale. He knew he had to make something different, so he went with the most polar opposite message he could. Just as impactful, but in the opposite way. Where Undertale showed us that our choices matter, Deltarune showed us that our choices don't mean anything. Where Undertale showed us that there's always a way to spare someone, Deltarune showed us that some people will fight no matter what. The king doesn't stop. He doesn't become our friend. He wants us dead from the beginning until the end. Undertale showed us that there's always a better solution, that there's a way for everyone to be happy, and we have a hand in making that happen. From the last scene in Deltarune, I'd say Toby's about to show us the exact opposite, that people will get hurt, that no matter what we do, we can't change that, and that what we control is only a very small piece to a much larger puzzle. And that small piece, the one pawn we control, ripped out our soul and threw it in a cage. We can't stop what's about to happen. It's the ultimate follow-up to Undertale, in a way no one would expect. That's just one of the great mysteries behind Deltarune, a daunting interpretation of what's to come. A great game can only be one with great joy, or one of great sadness. I would say Undertale was both, but Toby Fox won't do the same thing again. There's only one ending and I don't expect it to be happy. That's the story of Deltarune. The story you never knew. And that's my take on Deltarune. A little sad, I know, but sometimes you gotta let the tears flow. And before you head out, don't forget our not tear-inducing streams every weekday at 3 p.m. on Twitch. <laughs> not, I actually want to get an A. Oh! Oh! which means we're likely streaming right now. So come hang out with us at twitch.tv slash treesicle right now. We'd love to talk to you. Otherwise, make sure you hit that bell because this definitely won't be the last time we cover Delta Room. You're not going to want to miss the next one. Baba, ma. We're going off to college. It's Undyne. She's a police officer. Oh, no. A keeper I'm of order. Plugged by, I'm plugged by, I'm plugged back in. I need to rock out more. Uh, 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 uh.